today I'm going to talk to you about the lost doctrine, the stewardship of God's character, the lost doctrine. I believe that um, as we spoke about last night, God's character is under attack. And we're going to discover today one aspect of God's character that really will change everything for you. Ephesians 5 verse 22 was our scripture reading. And as our, my dear sister here read that scripture, I bet you she was wondering why on earth <laughs> would I have chosen that scripture reading. And I see the lady smiling because you noticed, didn't you? You noticed it. Who can say that Ephesians 5 verse 22, I'm talking to the ladies now, is their favorite verse? You know, we all have favorite verses in the Bible, right? Um, who, which of the ladies could say that Ephesians 5 verse 22 is their favorite? Anyone? No one? Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Nobody likes that verse. Oh dear. I can't imagine why. However, I'm going to take this portion of scripture which extends beyond that one verse and talk about the doctrine of submission today. So ladies, you can breathe in and relax. <laughs> so I usually start this um, with this topic. Uh, I have a, three, a series of three sermons that I do at a women's ministries um, retreat usually. And by the time I've read this verse, then they're wanting to throw tomatoes at me already. But as soon as we get into things, then I can see people relaxing. We know that that passage of scripture continues. It talks about wives submitting to their husbands, right? It also talks about husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for the church. So sometimes one would wonder, who would you like to be, the one who submits or the one who gives up his life? Quite a choice that. Then it moves on and it talks about par uh, parents and children. Children submit to your parents. And we fully agree with this, right? If we're parents. Children don't always agree with this, but the parents do. However, children, you will be glad to know that it continues and it says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. So once again, there's a kind of a reciprocal uh, part to that section. And then it even talks about slaves and masters. And we don't even want to talk about that today in these days, because we know that with all our human rights <coughs> focus, we can hardly even mention the word slave and not be in trouble. But if you continue reading through that part about slaves and masters, it says masters treat your slaves in the same way. In other words, there's a reciprocation here. Um, why? Why would Paul write about this? Today, we just don't want to talk about the word submission at all because it's politically incorrect, right? Um, it brings all kinds of things to mind. It brings things like abuse of power to mind. It, it brings a host of injustices to our thoughts. Uh, things like punishment or oppression. And then, of course, today we have the human rights movement. I wonder what would have happened if Jesus had claimed his rights on Easter Friday. And I wonder as Christians um, whether we believe that the human rights movement is the gospel because I don't see Jesus demonstrating that. I see him hanging on a cross, dying for my sins. I read a book once um, called The Politics of Jesus, where it talks about the notion of radical self-submission and what an empowering thing that is. First, it has to be a choice, though. It has to be you submitting yourself. It's not something that is imposed. Oppression doesn't bring about any good, and we know that. 
But giving up yourself is the ultimate power, even though power is not the essence of submission. When Jesus was at his weakest, when he had given up his very life, It was his most powerful moment. When Jesus hung dying on the cross, he gained the whole world. He gained you and me. Now that's the power of submission. Philippians 2 verse 1 to 12 is the most wonderful Christological passage in the Bible. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, in other words, have the same mindset as Christ. And then he shows how Christ was our example. Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and some versions say, and submitted to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, And gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So I need to ask you a question. What Christian discipline or what Christian doctrine became an issue in the great controversy as it started in heaven. We know that there was war in heaven, the Bible tells us. There was a controversy. What Christian discipline became an issue in this situation? We had the devil, we had Lucifer, the beautiful angel Lucifer, and we had God, and we had other angels. And something happened. What was that? worship last night we talked about true worship you're very right why did he not want to worship God jealousy there you go something else pride what is pride really when you think a lot about yourself right so We know that self-exaltation was an issue there, right? Self-exaltation. What is the opposite of self-exaltation? Self-submission. So let me ask you again, what Christian discipline, a discipline which we should follow, which Christian discipline fell by the wayside in Lucifer's mind? Submission. Submission. And instead, self-exaltation took over what discipline became an issue in the garden of eden could it be the same thing it was the same tempter so he was tempting adam and eve to exalt self what is the opposite of self-exaltation self-submission so here we have self-submission versus self-exaltation. I mentioned last night also the compilation from Ellen White called The Truth About Angels. And here, talking about um, the great controversy as it started in heaven, she mentions 
a secret. She says, peace and joy in perfect submission to the will of heaven. And you notice that heaven is in a capital H. So it means to the will of God. So peace and joy in perfect submission to the will of God existed throughout the angelic host. Love to God was supreme and love for one another was impartial. It means everybody loved each other the same. There were no favorites. Such was the condition that existed for ceaseless ages before the entrance of sin. How did the universe remain sinless in eternity past? Through perfect submission to the will of heaven, right? So if that is the case, if submitting to God's will and this discipline of submission is how the universe remains sinless in eternity past, how will the universe remain sinless in eternity to come? Perhaps in the same way, in perfect submission to the will of God. Are you beginning to realize that when Paul was talking about submission of wives to husbands and then the reciprocal statements, are you beginning to realize that this wasn't necessarily a lecture on the status of men and women. Are you beginning to realize that maybe this was a reminder of the Christian doctrine of submission and how important it is to the bigger picture? Submission is the lost doctrine. Submission is how we will remain sinless in eternity to come. Peace and joy in perfect submission to the will of heaven existed throughout the angelic host. Love to God was supreme. Love for one another was impartial. Such was the condition that existed for ceaseless ages before the entrance of sin, before the entrance of the opposite of submission, which was self-exaltation. What is a steward? We spoke a little bit about that already. A steward exists, if you look in the dictionary, you'll see something like this. A steward exists to take care of somebody else's business or interests, right? They put their own interests aside, and their job is to take care of somebody else's interests. A steward, therefore, submits his own interests and does the will of the Father. Can a steward, can stewardship be? Can a steward exist without the sense of submission? Is it possible to take care of somebody else's business if my own business is getting in the way all the time? If I think that my business is more important than the other person's business, there's going to be a great conflict. So stewardship can only exist if there is this notion, this Christian discipline of submission. Submission is the discipline or the doctrine essential for being a good steward. Why? Submission is part of God's character. Jesus is the ultimate steward, and we saw this on the cross. He gave up everything following the will of his Father. We need to be like Jesus in order to be good stewards. So we need to learn submission, the last doctrine. Husbands who impose submission on their wives might very well be putting their wives ahead of themselves in this journey to heaven. <laughs> and wives who dominate their husbands may be depriving themselves of the opportunity to learn this wonderful art of submission, this Christ-likeness of submission. It works both ways. We know that the character of God is on trial. Satan accused God of being unfair, and it's up to us, good stewards of God's character, to show that this is not true. And so, as stewards of God's character, we who are made in God's image need to reflect his image being Christ-like is the first duty of a good steward. All other good stewardship will fall into place after that. 
including the stewardship of our finances and including the stewardship of our relationships. What is Jesus like? We know that he's loving. We know that he's self-sacrificing. We know that he's compassionate. We know that he's giving because he is the ultimate example of the submission of self. There's no pride in Jesus. We started with Ephesians 5. So let's talk about relationships. Let's talk about the stewardship of our relationships. Now, first of all, we'd like to ask, as women, we often want to ask, why is Paul allowed to say these things that affect women so deeply? But you know, Paul was also a supreme example of submission. We know that he had quite a hard life. We know that he had a very submissive experience when the Lord revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus. I mean, he was on the ground. He was knocked out. He was blind. That was a very humiliating experience for him. And yet, Paul goes on to write, rejoice always, no matter what your circumstances. We know that he sang in prison. We know that he speaks about a thorn in the flesh that bothered him. We know that he had many trials. We know that he was shipwrecked and he went hungry and he was beaten. We, there's a whole long list of all the things that Paul went through. And yet he always said rejoice. I think that Paul was a good example of the submission to our circumstances. Don't we complain a lot? Don't we complain terribly about all the little things that irritate us in life? At the end of that Christological passage where it says Jesus submitted to death, even death on the cross, he says, continue without grumbling. <laughs> we grumble so much. So <clears throat> when we revisit Ephesians chapter 5, we see that Paul is qualified to write about submission. We see that submission is reciprocal. It's a reciprocal kind of self-submission that he's talking about. Actually, it's about sanctification. Because when we learn the art of submission, we're becoming Christ-like. What's one of the big words we use to call becoming Christ-like in Adventism? <laughs> sanctification, right? So we see that stewardship really is a very spiritual matter. It's actually about sanctification. Um, and it shows in the way we behave in other levels of our lives, in our relationships, in our giving, and so forth. I'd like to put to you that being Christ-like doesn't happen in a vacuum. If you were the only person on this earth, hmm, it would be hard to show how you were Christ-like. What would you do to show how Christ-like you were if, you, if, if it was just you? In fact, this is a great argument for the Trinity because they are more than one. They're three in one. And the love that they have between themselves is the greatest argument for the Trinity. So we see sanctification. We see good stewardship. We see the art of submission in certain situations, like marriage, like in parenting, and in our professions and in our personal lives and in our financial lives. Can you think how submission would play a part in your marriage or in your parenting or in your professional lives? Doesn't it really irritate you at work when your boss is so inconsiderate or your colleagues are always put ahead of yourself? Is this not an arena where you can practice the art of submission, of self-submission? The secret is Christ in you. The secret is always Christ in you. We die and Christ lives in us. That's how we become Christ-like. We cannot become Christ-like on our own. We can only become Christ-like if it is Christ living in us. We need to be like Jesus, and we need to know how to become like him. 
Here are three ideas. We need to know Jesus. You can't become like somebody if you don't know what they're like. So we need to know Jesus. We need to read our Bibles. We need to pray. We need to have experiences with Jesus. We need to know him. And in this way, we become filled by Jesus. And then we need to be fulfilled by Jesus. What happens if we are in a marriage that's not so good? And we're unhappy. And we have all these needs that God created us with. And they're not being met. And we're expecting our spouse to fulfill all these needs. And they just don't. I'd like to say to you today, ladies, since we started out with ladies, if you are needing anything in your marriage, get married to Christ. If you are married to Christ, it will set you free. You will not need to have all those expectations of your spouse. And perhaps your marriage will just become a better place. And this works both way around. So um, submission really, it's about spiritual maturity. Are you prepared to do Christ's will? Are you prepared to become like him? Are you prepared to represent his character and be a good stewardship of God's character? good steward of God's character. I would like to challenge you today, this Easter Sabbath, that if you become spiritually mature in these ways, you will have better results in all areas of your life, including your finances and including in your relationships. You will be a better steward in every area of your life. Let me talk about marriage more specifically, because I believe that marriage is under attack today. I believe that families are under attack. Uh, under attack. Marriage is one uh, institution that actually symbolizes God's character if it's conducted in the right way. We know that verse um, that says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Ladies, we also know this verse, don't we? And that that word helper has been analyzed and people have wondered if that includes washing the dishes and cooking and, you know, doing whatever else for your husband. What does that word helper mean? What could Adam be needing help with in a perfect world? It's a perfect world. They're newly created beings. They're in a relationship with God and he needs help. What, is he, what could he possibly need help with? If you go to the original language, it could be that a more direct translation of this verse would read as follows. It is not good, this existence of man to himself. And that's an interesting sentence. It is not good this existence of man to himself. What could go wrong in a perfect world? This wonderful creature that God has created could become selfish. What does he need help with? He needs help with becoming other-centered, other-focused. He needs to learn the submission of self. And he can only do that if he has somebody else to practice with. Does that make sense? That doesn't mean that you shouldn't wash the dishes because that's a good way to practice (laughs) self-submission. Oh, but I was talking to the men. (laughs) I'm just joking, but we know that in a perfect world, the only thing that could really go wrong was for man to become sinful and selfish. And Eve was placed there so that they could both become like God in the true sense, not like the way Satan deceived them to become like gods, right? Have you ever thought of Ellen White as a romantic? Ever? She says that we really need to, that marriage exists for us to encourage each other through spiritual difficulties, to help each other get to heaven. Marriage is for sanctification for heaven. And I'm not insensitive to... um, people who have suffered divorce but one of the reasons why we say it's wrong it's because it deprives us of the opportunity 
for sanctification. It deprives us of the opportunity to practice self-submission and become Christ-like. It's just too easy to leave our problems behind. Listen to this very romantic quote from Ellen White. You can tell me if you think I'm silly to say so, but I really think it's wonderful. It says, through difficulties, perplexities, and discouragements, though difficulties, perplexities, and discouragements may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or a disappointment. Determined to be all that it is possible to be to each other. Continue the early attentions. In every way, encourage each other in fighting the battles of life. Study to advance the happiness of each other. Study. Do you ever study to advance the happiness of your spouse? Do you take it that seriously? Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance, then marriage, instead of being the end of love, as it sometimes is, will, as it were, will be, as it were, the very beginning of love. I think that's very romantic. The warmth of true friendship, the love that binds heart to heart, is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. Brothers and sisters, marriage and any relationship has been put there to help us become ready for heaven. Let us take full advantage of these opportunities to develop our Christ-like characters and learn to submit to one another. Let's just put you to a quick test. <clears throat> Unconditional love. Love that puts itself last and others first. Some people say that marriage should be a 50-50 arrangement, right? You've heard that before. Uh, other people who think they're more clever say that no, it should be 100-100. And then there's another model which is a bit puzzling and it says it should be 100-0. Now I'd like to put it to the vote today. Which of you think that marriage is a 50-50 thing? Okay, we have one taker there at the back. Thank you for that, he's, he's bold. Who says it's 100-100? Usually all the people who wanna be safe put their hands up now. <laughs> You see, 50-50 is one, he doesn't mind only getting 50 because then at least he only has to give 50, okay? <laughs> I'm just joking, my brother. <laughs> then 100-100 sounds perfect, doesn't it? It really does. You give everything and then you get everything in return. But is that, is that what happens in reality? How many of you feel that you have given everything and you've gotten back exactly the same amount of effort that you've put in? Okay, I'm not asking for a show of hands now. I'll cause trouble. But it does sound good, doesn't it? What is the model that will save a marriage when somebody gives a lot and doesn't get much in return? Which model will save the marriage? 100 zero will save the marriage. Because these days we think marriage is for ourselves. We think it's for our happiness. It's for our fulfillment. Everything is about self. Marriage is for me and we exalt self, right? But we know that marriage is for preparing us for heaven and the art of self-submission and reducing all those expectations is really just going to um, be a great benefit to us. Which model is more Christ-like? How much did Jesus do for us? How much did he give for us? Everything. How much did we deserve it? Zero. Which model is more Christ-like? The hymn we sang, I didn't choose by accident. It says, nothing good for him I've done. How could he such love bestow? And that's a very appropriate thing to say on Easter Sabbath. Unconditional love puts self last. Young people, this is for you. Ask yourself <clears throat> that if you were to end up in a 100-0 situation with the person you are now dating when you're married, if you were to end up in a 100-0 position, how would you react? Would you be prepared to do that? Maybe you need to consider these things carefully before you get married. <laughs> 
and realize that marriage is a serious business and it's for sanctification and it's not just for what you can get out of the situation. Do you love them enough? And do you love them self-sacrificially and unconditionally? Now, we're not talking about abuse here. We submit self and we submit it to Christ. And this affects our relationship to each other. We practice submission of self. But we do not submit to evil. We act as Christ would, in, even in unjust situations, we act as Christ would, right? But we do need to protect those who are vulnerable. And we know that, we're adults and we know that. What do you need to submit today? On a weekend where we were thinking of Jesus who gave everything for us, what do we need to submit today as good stewards of God's character? Do we need to submit our marriages to him today? Do we need to submit our personal agenda to him today? What about your plans, those wonderful plans you have for your new business or for what you're going to study or your next trip or your next uh, piece of technology you're going to buy? Do you need to submit those plans to him? Do you need to submit your pride to Jesus today? What about your resources? What about funding God's work? Do you need to practice some self-submission today so that you can do that in a better way? Do you need to submit self today? The good steward says, my all in response to God's all.